Good afternoon, and welcome to the Today's Dietitian Learning Library webinar, Food as Lifestyle Medicine for Hormonal Health. I'm Leslie Sine, Director of Professional Development at Great Valley Publishing, publishers of Today's Dietitian, and I'm your host for today's webinar. Before we start today's presentation, I have a few points of housekeeping to review. First, in order to claim your credit, as you'll know, you have to remain with us through the entire hour-long presentation. Second, at the end of the session, our presenter will be taking questions. If you have a question, please type it in your comments box in your control panel. We'll try to address as many questions as time allows. In support of improving patient care, Great Valley Publishing Company is jointly accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education, the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, and the American Nurses Credentialing Center to provide continuing education for the healthcare team. This activity will also award credit for dietetics. Victoria Relney, RDN, faculty for this event, has no relevant financial relationships with ineligible companies to disclose. None of the planners for this educational activity have financial relevant relationships with ineligible companies to disclose. An ineligible company includes the entity whose primary business is producing, marketing, marketing selling, reselling, or distributing healthcare products used by or on patients. And now I'm pleased to introduce Vicki Rotelny. Vicki is a nationally recognized registered dietitian nutritionist, lifestyle nutrition expert, speaker, writer, and culinary and media consultant. She is the author of two books, The Essential Guide to Healthy Healing Foods and The Total Body Diet for Dummies. Vicki's passion is helping others evolve their eating to a healthier place by encouraging them to get into the kitchen with nourishing, empowering foods for a lifetime of health and happiness. She loves to eat with her husband and two teenage children in Chicago, Illinois. Vicki hosts a podcast, Nourishing Notes, which gives listeners quick two-minute nutrition tips. Her recipes and writings can be found on her blog, Simple Cravings, Real Food. Follow her on Instagram and Twitter at VSR Nutrition or on TikTok at VSR underscore nutrition. Mm. And so with all that, I'd like to turn it over to Vicki. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me here today talking about food as lifestyle medicine for hormonal health. You know, as dietetic professionals, a lot of us work side alongside endocrinologists in helping people manage or prevent hormone-related diseases or issues such as diabetes, thyroid diseases, and reproductive issues. And I know we all appreciate hormones and the vital role they play in our overall health and well-being throughout the lifespan. So every day our hormones miraculously work hard to create homeostasis or balance, but it's a challenge in a sleep-deprived, highly stressed fast food world, right? But there are things we can do to help our hormones too. So as you can see today's objectives, we're going to focus on some specific hormones and how we can educate our patients, clients, or speak in general in whatever area of practice we're in about how food as part of an overall healthy lifestyle can help balance hormone levels. So with that said, I'm going to start off with a little survey to get us thinking about hormones with a little trivia question. So I'd love you to take a minute and answer the following question. Which organ in the body does not produce hormones. Okay, so it's A, the brain, B, the gut, C, the spleen, or D, the thymus. So I'll give you guys just a couple of seconds. And I see that we've got, okay, we've got some good responses coming in. Great responses. Yes, the majority of people are saying see the spleen. So I've got 70, almost 75% of you saying the spleen. Some people think it's the brain, some with the gut. Great. I think we've got our answer, and the answer is C the spleen. You know, although the spleen plays a major role in immunity as it fights off germs in the blood, and it contains white blood cells, it filters blood by removing old, damaged red blood cells, the spleen does not produce any hormones. And as we'll see in this presentation, the brain, the gut, and the thymus do produce hormones. So thank you so much for your participation. That would be great. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So let's get started. Let's get started. So what are hormones? 
So let's chat about this. You know, hormones are magical in the body as they act as powerful chemical messengers in the bloodstream to organs and tissues in your body. The catch is only target cells with compatible receptors are equipped to respond to specific hormones. Plus, you know, hormones work slowly over time, and it doesn't take a lot. A small amount of a hormone can make significant changes in the body. So as you'll see in this webinar, hormones work synergistically in the body to control and coordinate energy metabolism, as we know, appetite, reproduction, growth and development, response to injury, stress, and environmental factors, and they do so much more, as we will see. So food has hormone-like activity in the body, and after all, it's information for our cells. You know, there's an article in Science, which I reference at the bottom of this slide. It so nicely talks about how our diets are a collection of signaling molecules having hormone-like actions with components or nutrients traveling through the blood, acting and activating cell surfaces and nuclear receptors. So there is a scientific theory that foods are a cocktail of hormones. So, for example, omega-3 fats are more than just energy for the body. They act in specific key tissues to improve cardiometabolic endpoints. So they actually have hormone-like activity. So, in other words, food can activate receptors like hormones do. So that's important to consider when you are thinking about your dietary plans for your clients. So the endocrine system is where hormones are governed by specialized groups of cells called glands that they, they make the hormones, the glands make the hormones. They're located throughout the body. So if you want to see if your hormones are balanced, lab tests can measure hormones in blood, urine, and saliva. Hormonal imbalances can occur from changes in hormone production, so over or under production, or interferences in signaling pathways. So as you know, hormone imbalances can lead to diabetes, weight gain, infertility, and other all health concerns if not managed properly. And we see this every day in our practice. So that's where we come in as registered dietitians and healthcare professionals. So hormone disruptors, so the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences investigates chemicals in everyday household products and naturally occurring compounds in foods that may disrupt normal functioning of the endocrine system and cause health-related problems. And some common ones are, you know, plastic in bottles and containers, liners of metal cans, you know, we see BPA-free on our cans very often, detergents, flame retardants toys, cosmetics, and pesticides. And when we talk about food, phytoestrogens, particularly the isoflavones, fit the Environmental Protection Agency's definition of an endocrine disruptor, which is characterized by altering the structure or function of the endocrine system and causing adverse effects. However, I must say later on in this presentation, I'll talk about evidence supporting the use of phytoestrogens to combat estrogen loss in postmenopausal women. So this ambiguity could be partially due to the variability of published studies as the beneficial or harmful effects of phytoestrogens depend on the exposure, so the type, amount consumed, and bioavailability, ethnicity of the person eating the phytoestrogen, hormonal status, so the age, sex, and physiological condition of the consumer is definitely something to consider when we talk about phytoestrogens. Okay, so let's talk about hormones and your brain. So the brain is a huge endocrine organ which houses many glands and important structures that are connected to glands. So let's look here. The pineal gland is a small pine cone shaped gland that produces and releases melatonin or the sleep hormone, which I'll be discussing in a few minutes. The hypothalamus is an almond-shaped structure that is connected to the pituitary gland and regulates the release of its hormones. And there, the pituitary gland is about the size of a chickpea, so it's not very large. I'm often surprised at how small these glands are. And it's a powerful player in hormone production. So that's hormones and your brain. Let's talk about hormones in your body because when we get our bearings on what organs produce what hormones, let's look at the anatomy for a minute. 
The thyroid is a butterfly-shaped gland located in the throat, and it produces thyroid hormone, which is made up of two hormones, T3 and T4. And they're made up of iodine atoms, which we'll talk about later. The thymus gland is located behind the breastbone and is involved in immune function. It's involved in the maturation of the T cells before you reach puberty. So after puberty, the thymus does shrink. Um, it's largest before puberty. Uh, pancreas, the pancreas is about the size of your hand located behind the stomach. So the major hormones it produces are insulin and glucagon. The adrenal glands, they're small triangular shaped glands located on the top of both kidneys. They produce the stress hormone cortisol plus other hormones and they make a small amount of estrogen as well. In females, ovaries produce estrogen and there are three forms. Estrone, estradiol, which is the most prominent hormone during the reproductive years, the most prominent estrogen during reproductive years, and estriol. And in males, testosterone is produced in the testes, and the testes also produce some estrogen as well in men. So that's just to get our bearings a little bit on the anatomy of our hormones. Okay, so let's talk about the gut because the gut is regarded as the largest endocrine organ in the body. There are 30 plus gut hormone genes and more than 100 bioactive peptides coordinating the show in the GI tract. So that's fascinating. Ghrelin is known as the hunger hormone and it's primarily secreted in the stomach and it does more than just tell us when we're hungry. It regulates sleep-wake rhythms, taste sensation, and the regulation of glucose metabolism. So ghrelin does more than just signify hunger. Leptin, the fullness or satiety hormone, is produced in adipose tissue, and it does more than let us know when to stop eating. It's linked to reproduction, blood pressure, and immune function. So these hormones do much more than we think, although they, they do have primary, um, primary functions. Okay, so let's talk about the gut-brain connection. So while hormones such as ghrelin and leptin are essential in maintaining balance and appetite and satiety control, it would not be possible without the hypothalamus coordinating the various hormonal inputs. So as we talked about, that hypothalamus is really pivotal. Signals from the gut and adipose tissue are important in regulating cessations of appetite and satiety respectively. The gut produces ghrelin, while leptin derives from adipose tissue and the hypothalamus integrates the signals from these two locations in regulating the energy balance of the body. Circulating ghrelin and leptin act on the hypothalamus for the body to adapt to meeting energy demands. So the gut and adipose tissue play a crucial role in signaling the hypothalamus whether more or less energy intake is required. So that gut-brain connection is vital in keeping hormones balanced, as we all know so well. Okay, so we're going to look at seven hormones and kind of, I'd like to, I mean, I could spend hours on each of these hormones, but I'll provide a brief overview and discuss how food and lifestyle can affect each one. And as I mentioned, hormones work together synergistically to keep our bodies functioning properly. If one is not being secreted properly, it can affect the others and create health problems down the road. So, Let's take a look at our first hormone, and these are in no specific order. Okay, so melatonin. Melatonin gets a ton of attention. It's called the sleep hormone, and I've heard it called the Dracula hormone because it thrives in darkness and it doesn't like light. It not only regulates our sleep-wake cycle, but helps with our immune health and works as an antioxidant, keeping our cells free from oxidative damage, Plus, it helps regulate metabolism and digestion. And studies have shown getting adequate amounts of melatonin can help clear up symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome, especially in night workers, because their circadian rhythm is off. It's produced in the small pine cone-shaped pineal gland from serotonin and its precursor tryptophan through a cascade of enzymatic reactions. So melatonin, while what you eat makes a difference in melatonin levels in the body, evidence shows that eating melatonin-rich foods 
may increase levels of this hormone in the bloodstream and possibly affect health and increase antioxidant capacity in humans. So if your clients are asking how to get more melatonin in their diets, suggest foods like salmon, you know, fatty fish, definitely, eggs, pistachios are extremely high in melatonin, mushrooms, certain cereals, seeds and legumes, tomatoes, peppers, grapes, heart cherries like the Montmorency variety, and certain herbs have melatonin as well. So keep in mind, melatonin is best released in the brain in the presence of darkness, therefore turning off lights, covering extraneous lights from digital clocks, phones, chargers, and laptops is a good idea to maximize your melatonin release. And then when we look at melatonin as a supplement, um, we all know that it's in supplement form. In 1994, the U.S. Dietary Supplemental Health and Education Act approved melatonin to be marketed as a supplement. And as far as dosage, according to the Sleep Foundation, there's no consensus at this time. It does depend on individuals' age and sleep issues. And high dosages are not recommended. It does create daytime drowsiness if you take too much. So a typical dosage of supplemental melatonin is one to three milligrams. And keep in mind, supplements are not regulated by the FDA. So encourage your clients to consult with a healthcare provider before starting to take it and check labels for certification. So the USP, the United States Pharmacopeia, is one. NSF is another certification body. And or look at reviews by consumerlab.com. And prior to taking a supplement, make sure your clients are creating a melatonin-enhancing sleep regimen. And like I talked about earlier, sleeping in complete darkness with blackout shades. But turning off electronics at least an hour before bed is what the recommendation is at this point. Okay, so our next hormone to focus on is oxytocin. This is called the love hormone, and I've also called it, heard it called the cuddle hormone. This is a happy hormone that's secreted by the pituitary gland, remember that almond-sized one in the brain, and it stimulates the contraction of the uterus and milk release in female breasts during breastfeeding. So this hormone allows trust and bonding between parents and children. It influences a broad range of diseases, especially diabetes, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Oxytocin receptors are epigenetically tuned by experiences of love, touch, and closeness with others early in life. And this is one of those feel-good hormones that we want to boost throughout our lives. So this is such a fun one to really think about and, and talk to your clients about. So when we look at the evidence suggests that there may be a link between oxytocin levels and the onset of diabetes, both type 1 and type 2. Research has shown lower levels of oxytocin in patients with both types of diabetes. And, you know, could this be due to the fact that this hormone has been shown to enhance glucose uptake and lipid utilization in adipose tissue and skeletal muscle? That is the question. You know, this suggests that dysfunction of the oxytocin system could underlie the pathogenesis of insulin resistance and dyslipidemia. So if you're interested in this topic, I definitely give references below on this link between oxytocin and diabetes. And there is an insulin link um, to oxytocin and diabetes working together. So that's, that's potentially the cause and the, the reason there is a link. Okay, so lifestyle behaviors to turn up oxytocin. There are a number of behaviors you can do to increase this hormone in the body. It's not only what you eat and enjoyment of the food you eat, but how you eat that increases oxytocin. So eating behaviors like cooking meals with others, sharing meals, laughing over a good meal can increase oxytocin. And other activities that connect you to yourself, yoga, Pilates, massage, listening to music, and meditation, or even listening to others empathetically really does release this hormone. Plus sexual intimacy, they're all tied to increased oxytocin levels. So we can tell our clients, cooking together as a family, going out with friends and sharing a meal, having a meditation practice or a yoga practice is so important to releasing this feel-good hormone in your body. 
Okay, the next hormone is insulin. So this is the glucose lowering hormone. And for those of you who work with people with diabetes or blood sugar issues, you know how important insulin is in the body. It's secreted by the pancreas and helps transport glucose in the body for energy metabolism. Insulin is also a hormone of fat storage. So reducing the amount of circulating insulin in the body is important to weight management. And insulin acts primarily in the skeletal muscles, the liver, the white adipocyte tissue, and in the brain. The brain has recently been discovered as an insulin-sensitive organ, and they have started, really, a lot of the research has started calling Alzheimer's disease type 3 diabetes for that reason, because the brain is very susceptible and sensitive to insulin. So let's look at food and insulin. You know, as you know, food has a great impact on insulin levels. So what we eat has a major effect on postprandial blood sugar and may cause or prevent insulin resistance. So to thwart the release of insulin and stabilize blood sugar better, some dietary factors to consider. So the amount and type of carbohydrates eaten at a meal and snack play a big role in keeping insulin levels in check or not. You know, high sugar carbs spike on some levels, creating highs and lows throughout the day, which is when we talk to our clients, we really do reiterate this. We know that fiber-rich carbs like whole grains, whole fruits and vegetables, beans, peas, and lentils can help stabilize blood sugar after eating for a longer per period of time, and it avoids overtaxing the beta cells of the pancreas. Balancing our plates with protein and healthy fats helps to thwart insulin release in the body and fill you up faster and longer. And keeping energy levels fueled by eating the majority of your calories during the day when metabolism is highest and less in the evening when metabolism slows down is a good way to keep insulin levels in check. And I feel that even in my own life I do that. You can feel when your energy level is highest during the day and it slows down at night, it makes sense to eat less at night. And of course, in accordance with the Diabetes Prevention Program, there are lifestyle interventions that can help keep blood sugar and insulin functioning properly in the body, such as you know, a small amount of weight loss, losing seven to 10% of your body weight, getting regular physical activity, 150 minutes is the recommendation, plus strength training. And strength training really helps building that muscle mass and also muscle really utilizes insulin levels, insulin. Um, behavioral therapy approaches can be highly effective in preventing and treating type 2 diabetes. So let's go on to cortisol. That's our next hormone. And Cortisol, as we all know, is the stress hormone. It's the main steroid hormone released from the adrenal glands. You know, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis regulates the production and secretion of cortisol. And this hormone thrives in light. So when we wake up in the morning, it's because of cortisol. Cortisol is released in the brain when we wake, in the adrenal glands, I'm sorry, when we wake, are waking and are exposed to light. So it's the fight or flight response that we feel when cortisol is released. It affects nearly every organ system in the body. So it mediates the stress response as well as immune function, inflammatory response, and metabolism. It's continuous continuously being balanced, too. Too much cortisol can lead to excess weight gain around the abdomen, and it makes it harder for insulin to work properly, leading to insulin resistance and potentially type 2 diabetes. And that's why we really want to work with people on balancing their cortisol levels and alleviating some of the stress in their lives. So stress and high cortisol can have a negative impact on the digestive tract, causing gas, bloating, and IBS-type symptoms. You know, many people hold their stress in their gut, which makes sense. So that's why we want to talk with people about what they're eating. And since cravings can increase during times of stress, you may crave more refined carbs, sugary foods, and alcohol with stress, it's helpful to remind clients to limit these types of foods. Plus, adding more fiber with whole grains, pulses, whole fruits, and veggies can keep the gut microbiome balanced with insulin stability, which can fend off cravings. 
The other one that I like to tell people is green tea contains L-theanine, which has been found to reduce stress and mental alertness. So monitor caffeine intake as coffee um, can cause too much coffee. I'm not saying don't drink coffee because I love coffee myself, but too much caffeine can cause adrenal fatigue, which can pose an issue with cortisol levels. And omega-3 fats can keep cortisol levels at bay. Also, staying hydrated can keep cortisol levels down. So it's not only what you're drinking, but also you're eating whole fruits and vegetables, which contain a lot of fluid as well. So I often tell my clients, eat those whole fruits and vegetables as well as drink fluids to keep yourself hydrated. Okay, so we're going to go into estrogen. And this hormone is a vital reproductive hormone released by the ovaries in women. It has many roles in the body. And estradiol, as I mentioned earlier, is the most abundant type of estrogen during reproductive years. Estrogen is extremely cardioprotective. You know, it controls lipid levels. It promotes bone health and protects the brain and affects mood. It decreases appetite by suppressing ghrelin, the hunger hormone. So progesterone stimulates appetite before the onset of your menstrual cycle. So that's why many women feel PMS-type symptoms of increased hunger and cravings because their progesterone level is elevated right before they get their periods. So loss of estrogen during perimenopause can lead to neurological symptoms, including thermal regulation. So unable to regulate body temperature, sleep, circadian rhythms, and sensory processing, and affects multiple domains of cognitive functioning. You know, estrogen is a master regulator that functions through a network of estrogen receptors. So it's such a vital hormone in our bodies as women. So it's no surprise that body composition is affected by estrogen levels. Body fat increases after menopause, specifically around the middle, due to the loss of estrogen and the relative increase in androgen levels, so male hormones. So a five-year follow-up study to so the Women's Health Across the Nation, SWAN study, reported that post-menopause women had a two-fold higher visceral abdominal fat and adipose tissue than premenopausal women. But there are definitely things you can do about that. Uh, the opposite and flip side of that coin is too low body fat in cases of extreme calorie restriction in women can reduce the amount of estrogen and lead to disrupt disruptions in the menstrual cycle. As we see with young women, athletes may have this happen as well. So that's why we want to keep estrogen balanced as much as we can. So this is where food and lifestyle changes come into play. So what we eat plays a role in balancing estrogen metabolism. So research shows that the Western diet, which is not a surprise to us, of highly processed foods, saturated fat with fried foods, refined grains, and bread and processed meats, plus high sugar foods and beverages, has been linked to estrogen dominance and increased risk for estrogen-related diseases, such as breast cancer, as well as ovarian cancer, blood clot, stroke, and thyroid dysfunction. So the Mediterranean diet, on the other hand, has been linked to lower levels of estrogen and body fat mass. So plant-based diets in general have been linked to lower levels of estrogen. So it's important to think about that. And those plant compounds play a key role in fending off, obviously, cardiovascular disease as well. So limit alcohol. If you do drink, I often tell my clients, Limit it to one drink a day for women and two drinks a day for men. So too much alcohol has been shown to increase estrogen levels in some people. So what does a drink look like? It's a five-ounce glass of wine. It's 1.5 ounces of liquor or it's a 12-ounce beer. So I like to tell people you cannot save up your drinks till the end of the week. So if you're drinking, do so with a meal as well. Um, getting regular physical activity can reduce circulating estrogen levels. And I really hone in on strength training with my clients because it's vital to maintain muscle mass and combat the metabolic changes during peri- and post-menopause. So more muscle equals what? Higher metabolism and helps keep our bone density up too. So I love talking to people about getting some strength training in. You can use your own body weight for strength too. So yoga and Pilates 
push-ups, sit-ups, and planks, they all work well to keep that muscle mass up. Okay, so let's talk about alternative remedies for postmenopausal women when estrogen declines, because that is a time when we want to think about our heart health as well. So phytoestrogens, you know, although they're controversial, as I mentioned earlier, they're often good antioxidants and anti-inflammatory agents. And they may help with night sweats and hot flashes, as well as bone loss and heart disease risk. So as you know, food sources include soy flour, tofu, flax seeds, legumes, fruits and vegetables, cereals, olive oil, and some wheat products do have phytoestrogens as well. There has been some research to support herbal remedies, such as ginseng, evening primrose oil, and ginkgo biloba, but the dosage and frequency of consumption must be talked through with a knowledgeable healthcare provider because there's no consensus on how much, plus it's based on the individual's needs. Some vitamin and mineral supplements may be beneficial for postmenopausal women, such as vitamin E, vitamin D, B vitamins, zinc and magnesium, as well as polyphenols like resveratrol have been looked at for uh, beneficial uh, purposes for postmenopausal women. So what the majority of what I have read, though, is a lot of these supplements, supplements it's not 100% conclusive. So a healthy, balanced diet is always the first line of defense. Okay, so growth hormone is up next, and it's an exciting hormone that does a lot in the body. I've learned a lot about growth hormone. And it's released by the pituitary gland and affects growth and development stimulates protein production and affects fat distribution in the body. Plus, as you can see, it affects bone metabolism, joint health, cognitive health, inflammatory bowel diseases, critical illnesses can benefit from growth hormone, wound healing and burns, fibromyalgia, hypertension, and postmenopausal osteoporosis. So growth hormone does a lot in the body. And when we look at growth hormone and nutrients, it's fascinating. You know, it's important to note that growth hormone works along, alongside the hormone insulin growth factor, so IGF-1, to promote growth and is influenced by nutritional state at every age. You know, IGF-1 and insulin are similar structurally and functionally, and IGF-1 is involved in glucose metabolism. So two-thirds of growth hormone secretion occurs during the night, with 70% of growth hormone released with the first episode of slow-wave sleep. So that's kind of fascinating. Growth hormone uh, goes into bursts, and it varies in frequency and amplitude according to age, gender, puberty status, menstrual cycle phase, sleep, exercise, nutritional status, and body composition. So there's a lot that affects growth hormone and when we secrete it. And balanced nutrition is essential to prevent deficiencies and overloads to maintain growth hormone and insulin-like growth factor one homeostasis. So it's important to think about balanced nutrition is affecting this um, growth hormone and IGF-1 axis. So what about carbohydrates and growth hormone? You know, this dynamic duo of growth hormone and IGF-1 is critical for carbohydrate metabolism. Too much circulating glucose lowers the amount of growth hormone secreted. So in order to tell if growth hormone is at optimal levels, you can use an oral glucose tolerance test, which is actually considered the gold standard, to see how well your glucose is being regulated. So highs and lows can indicate that growth hormone may be low or it may be too high. So it's kind of a fascinating look at that. And more research is needed to tell about the role of fiber-rich carbs to regulate growth hormone. So the relationship between growth hormone and protein is important. And it's been shown that high-protein diets can increase growth hormone levels, which can benefit growth and development at every age. You know, the timing and amount of amino acids could modify growth hormones response too. So how much and when you eat your protein can affect the secretion of growth hormone. And growth hormone preserves protein stores by stopping protein breakdown and stimulating protein synthesis in muscle and other tissues. 
So it's a pretty important hormone that often, I believe, is overlooked. So other uh, hormones that affect, I'm sorry, growth hormone and other nutrients, there's a close link between dietary fats. You know, growth hormone is linked to lipid metabolism, too. It plays an important role in controlling intermediate metabolism within the cells, body composition, and energy expenditure. So growth hormone works with various micronutrients, too. So as you can see, vitamin D and the growth hormone IGF-1 axis are fundamental to skeletal growth and bone maintenance. It works closely with calcium. So that axis works closely with calcium. Zinc and iron, essential for human growth and share the same transport pathway in the gut, they actually compete for absorption. So iron more than zinc is correlated with growth. And iodine is closely linked to growth hormone and IGF-1 axis with its tie to the growth stimulating thyroid hormone. So thyroid hormones are important for normal growth hormone expression. So there we see the synergy again, these hormones working together in unison to uh, function properly. So in the final, this final slide on growth hormone, I want to drive the point home that balance of the growth hormone and IGF-1 are strictly connected to nutrients as they are modifiers of this hormonal axis. So therefore, a diet with a balanced mixture of nutrients is ideal. So this is why an improperly balanced diet can affect growth, muscle building, and nutrient sensing, which is how our cells respond and adapt to fluctuations in environmental nutrient levels. So we can see how important a balanced diet is when you look at growth hormone alone. It's, it's actually really fascinating. Okay, so let's look at the last hormone I'm going to talk about today, which is the thyroid hormone. And it's collectively T3 and T4, which makes up the thyroid hormone. It controls metabolism, affects growth, maturation, and nervous system activity. So how does lifestyle affect thyroid hormone? So when we look at the different facets of lifestyle, so smoking, and obviously we know we really talk with our clients to, you know, not smoke or to stop if they can. Smoking can inhibit the absorption of iodine and thyroid hormone production. So that's just one thing we want to really instill in our clients. Drinking too much alcohol can have toxic effects on thyroid cells. So once again, keep in mind, it's not a drink with a meal or having moderate alcohol. It's if they're over imbibing. Hypo or hyperactive thyroid levels can affect metabolism and lead to weight gain and weight loss. And when we see our clients, that's something we do ask them, have they had their thyroid levels checked if they've experienced weight fluctuations recently. Exercise has variable effects on thyroid hormone, but there is a consensus that it does benefit thyroid health in general. And soy foods it may affect vulnerable populations with hypothyroidism, iodine deficiency, or disorders. And those brassica vegetables, so those cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, have been shown to be potentially goitrogenic, but for the most part, the research in humans has shown no effect, which is was good news because we're constantly, you know, telling people to be eating these cruciferous veggies, which are so vital for our overall health. Uh, tea and coffee in moderation have shown no effect, but more research is needed. And um, selenium supplementation has been used to treat thyroid disorders. But obviously, you have to look at everyone as, the in, as an individual and treat as necessary. Okay, so iodine and thyroid health. You know, iodine is an essential micronutrient in making thyroid hormone. So most of us get enough iodine in our foods and iodized salt. But here you'll see a list of iodine-containing foods, a lot of dairy products, uh, seafood products, and soy products. The RDA for iodine is 150 micrograms a day. And during pregnancy, that RDA goes up to 220 micrograms a day. And during breastfeeding, it's 290 micrograms a day. So typically, men and women in the U.S. get enough iodine from their diets. 
And interestingly, seaweed is the highest source of iodine. So 10 gram serving of seaweed is 232 milligrams. So well above the RDA. So um, animal foods are also good sources of iodine. So for example, an egg contains about 26 micrograms of iodine and a cup of cottage cheese contains 65 micrograms of iodine. So I often think back to when I was pregnant and I was craving cottage cheese. Maybe it was that iodine that I needed, the additional uh, iodine when I was pregnant. Okay, so let's chat about applications in practice for a minute. So when you're working with clients and patients, you can create a hormonal health checklist in your nutrition assessment, which would include targeted questions like, What's your daily stress level? Do you crave sugary foods often? You know, how much sleep do you get a night? And how are they sleeping? Do they sleep in a dark room, turn off electronics at least an hour before bed? How much social activity do you get? Because as we looked at, socialization and eating with others boosts that oxytocin level. Do you eat meals alone or with others? Do you have a yoga, Pilates, or meditation practice? Do you pay attention to balancing your diet with fiber-filled carbs, lean proteins, and healthy fats, which we all do ask them this. But if you drink alcohol, how much? And is it with a meal? So you may look at it through a different lens after listening to this webinar and thinking, wow, we're balancing hormones as well as balancing the plate, not just for weight management, but for a variety of reasons. And hormonal health being one of the most important ones that we think about. So some key takeaways, you know, hormonal health requires a holistic approach. So all lifestyle factors can play a role. A balanced, nourishing diet can keep hormones in sync, and healthy fats, nuts and seeds, whole fruits and vegetables, as well as quality proteins play a big role in keeping our hormones in check. Poor dietary habits may wreak havoc within the endocrine system, contributing to hormonal imbalances and long-term health consequences. So we want to really think about that with our clients, which we do. Chemicals, pesticides, and alcohol in the diet may negatively impact hormone levels. And frequent use of stimulants, such as caffeine and even depressants like alcohol, excess sodium consumption, eating processed sugars can interfere with metabolic processes, harm cardiovascular health, and increase the risk for hormonal repercussions. And lastly, you know, caloric needs are relevant factors to consider as well with female patients being particularly prone to sensitivities to extreme calorie restriction, which often results in the downregulation of sex hormone production. And like I talked about with estrogen, it's important to uh, women and men to get the adequate number of calories daily. So some hormone-related resources, if you're interested in delving into this more so, and obviously there are references on each slide that you can take a look at if there is a particular interest in a specific hormone, but um, taking a look at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences is really great to, to investigate. The Sleep Foundation, Women's International Pharmacy is an excellent website. The American Thyroid Association, if you do see a lot of clients with thyroid-related diseases. Endocrine Society, the American Diabetes Association, obviously, and the American Institute of Stress has some really interesting information on their site, especially as we see our clients during this time of, of high stress in our society. So that, without further ado, that is it. Thank you so much for joining me, and I'd be happy to take any questions or comments you have at this time. And Leslie, if there are any questions, please let me know. Absolutely. Thank you, Vicki. That was fantastic. We have a lot of questions coming in hot and heavy now. Um, let's just start from the top and go down the list. Um, from Saskia, she wants to know regarding ghrelin regulating the sleep-wake cycle, how, if at all, does that relate to sleep patterns and or insomnia? Very good question. You know, ghrelin, because our hormones are reset at night, so a lot of sleep is so vital for resetting and recalibrating hormones. And ghrelin, because it is that hunger hormone, 
it does, there is a lot of impact on getting adequate sleep and ghrelin and, and how much ghrelin you are secreting actually during the day as well. So the question was, how is it affecting the sleep patterns or insomnia? Yeah. You know what? There's the different, it's, it's all kind of, um, like I said, the synergy of hormones is definitely comes into play with sleep and with how gut hormones relate to the brain and the secretion of melatonin as well. So it's that gut-brain relationship. So if a client actually, you can look at it a number of different ways. It depends on the individual. You know, if they're under a lot of stress, if they're not sleeping in a dark room, or they are, um, you know, going to bed late or have laptops on right before they go to sleep, there's a lot of different variables with insomnia, and many times it stems from them just not having those healthy bedtime routine and healthy sleep hygiene habits. So it, it, there's a lot of different variables. And a lot of ways that these hormones work together to um, either help with sleep or actually hinder sleep. So that's a really good question. The Sleep Foundation can have a little more information on that as well. Perfect. Great. Okay, let's sort of change uh, gears for a second here from Sarah. Can lower levels of estrogen in perimenopausal women cause triglyceride levels to increase? Absolutely, yes, because estrogen, estrogen helps with lipid metabolism. So I see it very often during perimenopausal years, and perimenopause can be a long time. It could be a 10-year window before they actually go into menopause where they're seeing these physiological changes. I see a lot of women with hyperlipidemia, so high cholesterol levels when they're in perimenopause because estrogen levels are not balanced. And estrogen, like I said, actually affects lipid metabolism. So yes, there, there can be a correlation with that. And you can have your estrogen levels checked if you do feel like there may be something happening. Maybe it's early in perimenopause, or maybe a woman doesn't suspect that she's in perimenopause. So there are women that go through uh, menopause earlier than others. So the typical age for menopause is like 51 or 52 years old, but it does vary. So that is a great question. Yes, lipids are very affected by estrogen levels. Perfect. Okay, and you gave me a good transition there. The next question from Emma, are lab results of hormone levels essential to start helping a client or patient balance their hormones? And sort of part two to her question is, if not, or if you can't get lab results, how would you start without, the individ without knowing the individual's hormone levels? So are labs essential, number one? And then if you can't get them, number two, how do you approach an individual, you know, looking for help with their hormones? Sure, absolutely. I, you know what, I don't think lab levels are essential. I look at the person's profile, you know, what their lifestyle is like, how their diet is, what their um, symptoms are, you know, are they having various symptoms that might indicate that their hormone levels may be off? What is their weight status? You know, has it gone up? down, what's their energy level. There's a lot of ways that we as practitioners can actually um, assess hormone levels, not, you know, not knowing numbers, but actually looking at their lifestyle to tell if, hey, you know, this is a red flag. It sounds to me like a, you know, it might be the thyroid hormone. I'm not going to, I'm not going to diagnose that, but I will create some lifestyle change approaches for them that may help with balancing their hormones. So it's not essential to have labs. I would recommend, though, if you suspect something from a patient, to have them go get their labs checked and follow up with you, because that is a really good way to, not only for continuum of care, but also to just um, really kind of work well with the client and, and get them to reach their health goals. Perfect. Hopefully Perfect. that answered. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I think it was spot on. Um, let's see. Okay, how about this one from Amy? Uh, she's seen some controversy or read some research about controversy um, regarding the effect of intermittent fasting 
and generally meal skipping uh, and the effects on women's reproductive health and the thyroid. Do you have any comments or uh, opinion on that topic? Yeah, you know, as far as the thyroid, I uh, would not know much about the intermittent fasting. I do know that from our circadian rhythm and like chrononutrition, which I did, I think, put in quotes in the presentation, that's a big area of study right now. So how and, you know, when we eat our meals is really being heavily researched. Uh, so really, when we think about circadian rhythm and eating more during the day when the sun is highest in the sky and less at night where our energy levels are starting to wane, that it really makes sense that the thyroid or our energy metabolism would be tied to that. So as far as, you know, during pregnancy or, or other um, metabolic times in our lives, that I don't know, but I, I would think that there may be some tie to it. You can certainly research that. Um, you know, the American Thyroid Association may have some more information on that. But intermittent fasting is definitely an area of study that's burgeoning, and it's it's definitely tied to energy levels. You know, people that eat more during the day and less at night tend to report more energy. And that, you know, that is subjective, but it is something that we as practitioners should definitely consider. Great. Okay. Um, okay, from Jessica, and this one actually a couple other folks um, chimed in when you were talking about um, sugar cravings. So from Jessica specifically, what would you recommend for people that answer yes to sugar, sugar cravings? Very good question, because I get a lot of clients with sugar cravings. So what I often recommend is I look at the quality of their diet. So if they're craving sugar, are they eating a lot of sugar in general anyway or refined carbohydrates? Maybe they're not getting enough protein. So I do recommend protein with all meals and snacks because obviously protein doesn't affect insulin levels the same way that carbohydrates do. So And also healthy fats, so protein, healthy fats with meals and snacks along with whole grain carbohydrates, because that balance is actually going to help thwart that insulin release, and it's going to keep blood sugar more stable. The other thing is look at their stress level. So if someone's really craving sugar, sugar actually is something that the brain does crave when we're under stress. Sugar can thwart the release of cortisol in the brain, which I've seen in studies, and I like to tell people it's kind of a cruel joke of nature that we crave this sugar because it helps kind of clamp down on cortisol. But what I do want to recommend for people is that they really instill balance in the client, not to go sugar-free necessarily, but replacing that sugar with healthier, you know, lean proteins, whole grains, and healthy fats to so try to get them really thinking about the balance in their meals and snacks, and that's going to help thwart those sugar cravings. Plus, make sure they are getting adequate sleep. You know, there's a lot that ties into that because, like I said, hormones are reset during sleep. And if we're not resetting our hormones properly, we can crave those refined carbohydrates. All right. Hopefully that answers. Sense. Yeah, perfect. Okay, switching gears again from Alexandria. Um, when you reference smoking, of course, we all want to recommend that smoking is not, you know, don't smoke, <laughs> not a good thing. Right. Uh, but Alexandria right. diving a little bit deeper into smoking is asking, is it the nicotine or tobacco or something else specifically that inhibits iodine absorption? Very good question. Um, I, you know what, I have seen nicotine as indicated as potentially inhibiting, but that's not set in stone. I think a lot of the research is not conclusive on why smoking necessarily um, is not great for thyroid health and obviously iron absorption. So, um, but I, I do believe it's nicotine and not, and obviously tobacco does have negative properties. <laughs> so we really want to think about, you know, smoking in general as being something that can affect the thyroid hormone. But um, I do believe it's the nicotine. Yeah. Okay. Either way, not a good thing to smoke. So I think just cutting that out will solve the problem, right? 
Right. And we see this with vaping and other types of smoking that, yes, so we want to really kind of avoid that, um, that nicotine exposure if we can. Absolutely. All right. We've got time for a few more. Um, let's see. Okay. Here's an interesting one from a different Sarah. What are your thoughts regarding organic foods versus non-organic and endocrine disruption? Do you see or do you have any um, uh, knowledge on the difference of endocrine disruption, organic versus non-organic? No, absolutely not. I often tell people organic and conventionally grown do not pose different um you know, affect our health status that differently. Um, a lot of the research has looked at conventionally grown produce versus organically grown, and really the nutritional status of those foods doesn't vary much. So I would like to tell people don't, you know, eat foods with a lot of pesticides because that's obviously um, potential for endocrine disruption, but they do use organic-grade pesticides on organic foods. So you do want to be careful of, you know, scrub, I always tell people, scrub your foods, clean your foods, fruits and vegetables well, have a dedicated scrub brush, just with cold water. You don't have to use a special spray or wash for organic or conventional produce. Just, you know, make sure you're washing your produce when you get it home, and that really will help to um, remove any chemical compounds that may be on your produce. Perfect. Okay. All right. So let's see. Let's go to this one from, uh, let's see. Oops, I lost my, here we go. From Jennifer. Um, if a client comes in or is dealing with hypothyroidism, um, should RDs discourage soy foods? There is some research uh, that says that soy has long been thought to interfere with the body's ability to absorb medications that treat hypothyroidism. Any comments or feedback on that? Yeah, there is some research about medications and soy foods. Um, it does depend on how much soy the person is eating. So if, you know, if it's moderate amounts, low to moderate amounts of soy foods, you know, if they have tofu, you know, once a week or twice a week, I wouldn't say that's detrimental. I would say if they are over, it does depend on the medication. So I would, I would have a conference with their endocrinologist and chat with the endocrinologist too and bring him or her in the loop on what this patient's diet looks like and what they recommend based on their medication. Because it's a big consideration when you think about um, thyroid health medications and soy foods. So definitely talk with the endocrinologist about that as well. And, and then you can have sort of a continuum of care with that client. Awesome. 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 Okay. Last question. Um, this one's from Jessica. Uh, she's noticed a lot of clients are reluctant to take vitamins or supplements um, for hormone health. For example, quote unquote, I don't want to take something that messes with my hormones. I think we've either all have said that or yes. at least have heard it. <laughs> so any yes. recommendations on how RDs can combat that barrier when providing MNT to their clients? That's a really great question. Great question. I mean, there's so many supplements out there. And my caution with supplements is they are not regulated by the FDA. So I often tell, you know, even my clients, you know, definitely check labels, make sure they're vetted, and they are supplements that do have in them what they say they have in them. So before you're recommending any supplement, definitely check out consumerlab.com for any reviews on the supplement. It's just important to think about that because there are supplements that can, um, you know, downregulate or upregulate different hormones, depending upon the person, what they're eating, their lifestyle, and their genetic makeup. So it's kind of interesting to think about when you look at supplements, it, we're shooting in the dark a lot of times. So you want to pay attention to what the supplement is and also um, the efficacy of that supplement for that person. So everyone is an individual, and as, as we know, as practitioners. So do a little homework on the supplement before recommending it, and that's what, you know, that's what I recommend uh, to you as a practitioner, but also to the patient as well. Because to, to 
put out a blanket statement like that will mess with my hormones isn't necessarily true, but it's, it's looking at the patient as a whole. And once again, that holistic approach is really important to consider in our patient care. Awesome. Awesome. Hopefully Thank you so much, good. Vicki. That was great. Yeah, you tied it up very nicely with a bow on that one. And I just want to extend our thanks again. So there was a lot of excitement about today's presentation. You had tons of registrants. And I just want to thank you for sharing your expertise on this topic. Thank you so much for having me. I so appreciate it. And I wish everyone a great day. Instructions for credit claiming and downloading handouts should be up on your screen. You must complete a brief evaluation of the course in order to claim your credit and download your certificate. Registered dietitians should use code 175 when recording this activity in their professional development portfolio. To complete the evaluation for this program and obtain your certificate, click Next or return to the course start page and select the evaluation step.